Matthew 24, please. Tonight, another in our series of bees, what manner of person ought ye to be? Be not deceived. I'm, I'm, I've been wrestling about that quite possibly at the end of the year I may take all of these and put them in a book form and call it B, what manner of persons ought you to be, and then make that available. I may need a proofreader for that, okay? So you're up to the job, okay? And uh, I may, uh, I hesitate to say something publicly, then you really got to do it, you know? So uh, it's like the, <laughs> so I'll go out on a limb, I guess, and say that, all right? Well, Matthew 24, verse number one, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Father, I pray you'll add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And Lord, as we look at this important subject tonight, and one that you gave us multiple warnings of throughout the scripture, I pray, Lord, that we would take it to heart tonight, and the things that we look at this evening, and the things that we study from your word, would be a help, and a blessing, and a challenge uh, to each one of us. And that, Lord, we would determine before we even get the study completed that we would be doers of the word and not hearers only. So Holy Spirit, be our teacher tonight and help each one of us as we look into your word. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, the disciples asked Jesus for a sign about his coming and of the end of the age. And all Jesus told them was, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, when it talks about the end days, it says this, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Look with me in the book of Revelation. Will you turn to the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, and look with me at Revelation 18. Would you start there with me? Revelation chapter 18. Be not deceived. In Revelation 18, and look with me at verse number 23, where the Bible says, And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, and for thy sorceries were all, and by thy sorceries were all nations, what? Deceived. He's talking here about the nations of the earth and, and God's judgment upon them. And he talks about how they were all deceived. Now look in verse chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse number 20. The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he did what? Deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. Why would... Why will, people re why will people receive the mark of the beast? And why would they worship the image? Because they are deceived. They're deceived. Look at chapter 20 and verse 10. The Bible talks about, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Deceive. The great deceiver is Satan. He started it back in the Garden of Eden when he deceived Adam and Eve and got them to eat of the fruit that God said they should not eat of. But he goes all the way through. He's deceiving now. He'll deceive all the way till he's thrown into the lake of fire. He's a deceiver. What does it mean to deceive? Well, I think you have a definition there. It means to mislead the mind. To deceive means to cause to err. To cause to believe what is false. Or to disbelieve what is true? So, uh, uh, Satan deceives us. Men deceive us. Sin deceives us. And guess what? 
we deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves. That's why Jesus says, take heed that no man deceive you. So we'll look at this another B here this evening, and it'll be B, not deceived. In other words, don't be misled. In other words, do not believe what is false. Don't be taught to disbelieve what is true. Don't be deceived. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 11 with me, would you please? Deuteronomy chapter 11. That's where we start for our first one. Deuteronomy 11. Look look with me at verse number 16. Deuteronomy 11 and verse 16. The Bible says, Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods, and worship them. So we sign, first of all, don't be deceived by your own heart. Don't be deceived by your own heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9. So the the heart is deceitful and who can know it? Look at the New Testament. Matthew chapter 15. What did Jesus say about the heart? Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Notice what Jesus said about the heart. And by the way, that's the the core of man, the the, the inner being of man. And by the way, uh, you got the same evil, wicked heart that I have. Okay? We're all in the same boat. I know sometimes we look at somebody and say, oh, they have a good heart. No, they don't. (laughs) Sorry. Burst your bubble. But everybody has a wicked heart. Okay? And notice what it says in Matthew 15. Jesus says this, verse number 19. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but eat with unwashing hand, defile not a man. They were complaining about the disciples eating without washing their hands first and thought they'd be defiled. And Jesus said, that's not what defiles you. It's what comes from inside of you, from the heart of man. Did you see the list that he gave? Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. That's why... That's why when you try to cure somebody of a stubborn habit or addiction, if you don't get to the heart of the matter, you're not getting to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is in the heart. That's, That's where it is, and your heart will deceive you. And man by nature is evil. Man by nature can do some awful, horrible things. They can steal, they can murder, they can rape. And where where there is no law, man will do whatever they can get away with. You saw that even in the hurricane when it went through Florida and the the, uh, looting of the stores and and people with video watching, breaking windows and going in and carrying things out of the store. You see, they do whatever they can get away from. It's interesting. Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers, wrote, If men were angels, no government would be necessary. (laughs) But men are not angels. (laughs) And so they're fallen creatures and were bent towards sin and selfishness. Dictatorships always result in oppression for the people. Ben Franklin said this, There's scarce a king in a hundred who would not, if he could, follow the example of Pharaoh. First, get all the people's money, then get their lands, and then make them and their children servants forever. It's just what Pharaoh did. So you understand that, you have to understand we're, we're weak, we have a sinful nature, and we're inclined and have the bent to do the, the propensity to sin. In fact, you can be a, a slave to sin. And you can be an addict to sin. All of us are. And so you have to understand, until you realize that and confess it to God, there's no hope and there's no help. One of the first things that you have to get someone who has an addiction to admit is they have an addiction. 
And one of the, what, what's one of the first things you have to do to get somebody to be saved? They have to admit that they are a sinner who needs to be saved. A lot of times the reason people won't get saved is they don't think they're lost. Oh, I'm not that bad. I don't think I'll be that bad. I'll go to hell. Yeah, we're all that bad. We'll all go to hell if you don't accept Christ as your Savior. In fact, 1 John 1 and verse 8. Uh, 1 John chapter 1. You want to flip over there with me? 1 John 1 and verse 8. This is Bible study. I guess it's okay to use your Bible, isn't it? 1 John 1. These are great verses here in 1 John 1 and verse 8. Lest you think that, well, that's those people. They got problems with sin, but I don't. Well, let's, let's see what John says. 1 John 1 verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. Nobody here can say, I don't sin. And I have not sinned. Nobody can say that. If you do, you're deceiving yourself. You're deceiving yourself. And, and your heart is deceiving you. There's a great verse, Proverbs 28 and verse 26. Proverbs 28, 26. If you don't have it, you write it down. You know what it says? He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Wow. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Somebody says, hey, just follow your heart. No, don't do that. Why? Your heart will deceive you. Don't follow your heart. The fool trusts in his heart. Why does, how does the heart deceive us? Well, number one, the heart deceives us by selective memory. You know, someone said, I don't know how they figured it out, but they, they say we forget about 99% of the things we do wrong. We have selective memory. However, it's been documented that you can remember almost everything wrong that your spouse did. It's amazing how a husband won't remember what they did wrong, but the wife can sure remember everything. Amen? And vice versa. It goes both ways. Many times other people's memory of your wrongs is a lot more accurate than yours. You know that to be true. The second way our heart deceives us is we rearrange reality. So what does that mean? Not only do we have selective memory, but what we do remember, we've rearranged some of the facts. To where it's not, it, it's, it's our, we perceive it to be that way, but that isn't the way it was. And sometimes we recall the way things are, and boy, sometimes people who were there look at us and think, it wasn't that way at all. We've rearranged the facts in our minds. Like, like Aaron in the golden calf. Remember when Moses confronted Aaron and said, man, what's this thing? Aaron said, well, I just threw it in there and this thing came out. Really? No, you go back and read it. He fashioned it. He made that thing. But, but in his mind, he wasn't remembering that. He had rearranged the facts to figure, hey, I just threw this in and boom, there it was. It seems kind of ridiculous to those of us who, who, who look at that. But it didn't seem that way to Aaron when he said it, I'm sure. So we, 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 get, we can get so used to lying to ourselves that we believe it to be true. We rearrange the facts. Our heart deceives us by selective memory, by rearranging reality, or by excusing. We begin to excuse our, our sin. We begin to excuse our wrong. Well, if they wouldn't have said that to me, then I wouldn't have had to do that. Well, if they wouldn't have acted that way, then I wouldn't have had to do, you see, and we begin to make excuses as to why we did what we did or why we said what we said. If if your apologies are more like, well, if I did anything wrong, forgive me. As opposed to, I was wrong. Please forgive me. See, 
then you're excusing your behavior. Your heart is deceiving you. Boy, that's quiet, isn't it? We give... When you begin to excuse yourself, you begin to give yourself permission to do the wrong thing. And, and you, you excuse what you're doing. Well, well, they did it to me. Sound like two kids fighting, don't you? They did it first. Like, if it's okay if they hit me, then I can hit them, right? We're on the wrong track when you go that way. So what do you do? You don't follow your heart. What do you follow? You follow God's Word. You follow God's Word. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. You're not far from there. If you just go to your left a little bit, you should hit Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Most of you know it. It says, For the Word of God is quick, alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it says, uh, Piercing to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, of the joints and the marrow. Now look at it. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of what? The heart. What is it that will give you discernment? And, 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 and the discernment is, is distinguishes. That which distinguishes. That which causes us to understand. How can I understand my heart? I can't. But God's Word does. And so it's the Word of God. As you spend time in God's Word, it'll help you understand, discern, distinguish the thoughts and intents of your heart. You'll know whether your heart's leading you in the right way or not because of the Word of God. And you follow God's Word. It's a discerner. It's a distinguisher. It helps you understand the thoughts and intents of your heart. The Word of God. So don't be deceived by your heart. Okay? Number two. Number two, Luke 21. Luke chapter 21, please. Do not be deceived by false teachers. Do not be deceived by false teachers. Luke 21. Again, this is Luke's account, pretty much of what we read in Matthew. They said in verse number 7, they asked Him, Jesus, saying, Master, when shall these things be? What, and what sign will be when these things shall come to pass? And He said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in My name, saying, I am Christ. Now watch. And the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. God tells us, watch out. For people who claim to be me. There have been many through the years that have claimed to be Jesus Christ. Are they claim to be, or they claim that, that, that Christ is coming. You know, Jesus said, don't be deceived by people like that. There are many cults, there's false prophets, there's many lost preachers and evangelists that would deceive us and deprive us of a relationship with God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But you understand the Mormon church doesn't believe that. Amen. You understand the, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that. And, and so you have, you have Buddhists that don't believe that. You have the, the Islam that doesn't believe that. And so they would deceive people. And let me add to this. Nobody knows the day or the hour of His coming. Okay? You, you are aware that He's coming Saturday, September 23rd. You really don't have to worry about Sunday church, I guess. That's the latest one that's on the horizon. A big asteroid's hitting the earth and it, everything's, going, everything's over as of Saturday. But let me, let me help you with something. I, I, I actually Googled this. The... How many times people have said the world's going to end or Jesus is coming? And I, I, I was stunned. How many times through the 90s? In fact, it ended up over 40 different times in the 1900s. People set dates saying this is when Jesus was coming and the world would end. 
Unbelievable. I, I remember some of these. Um, I mean, more and more recent years. I mean, uh, there was, in, in, I mean, 85, 1985, 1988, 1989, 1990, 1991, 1992. I guess they just figure they say it every year. One of these years I'll hit it, right? <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, right on through uh, the 2000 and, and of course, the, the, the Y2K and all that. But now listen, in the whole 100 years of 1900, there were 39 different times that they said, world's going to end, Jesus is coming, it's all over. Okay? 39 times out of that 100 years. We're only 17 years into 2000s. And there's already been 40 different guys who have set dates saying Jesus is coming. In just 17 years. The latest being, of course, this, this coming. But there's already some that, that have set it out for 2018, and I saw 2020, and uh, all different kinds of dates. Uh, you don't know the day or the hour. Some of you remember in 2011, a guy named Harold Camping talked about it, and they put up billboards, and they, it was supposed to be May 21st, and then that didn't happen, and they said, oh, we miscalculated, it's October 21st. And people, you know, I mean, quit their jobs and sold everything. And it was, it's tragic what some of the things that took place. And, of course, he's, he's now gone, and I, I hope in heaven, and he got straightened out on his thinking. You see, that, that nobody knows the day or the hour when Jesus will come. And, and I think it's, I mean, you just, it's, it's, it's fascinating to read all this. It doesn't do anything for you spiritually, but it's just fascinating to read it. Uh, one, guy, one guy has in 2018, he calls his, the Bible guarantee on May 20th, 2018, are your money back. That's what he said. Wow. So, don't be deceived. Okay. When somebody, when somebody says, hey, I got the day he's coming back, just, just, just write it off right there. Say, no, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay? Uh, there's, there's no day or hour that, that someone knows uh, when the Lord will come. And uh, that's, Jesus never said, sit, sit around and keep trying to figure out when I'm coming. He didn't say that. He said, occupy, stay busy serving me until I come. Okay, we're looking for him, we're expecting him, but we don't know the day or the hour. And again, logically, you can't know that. Right now, soon, a month from now, uh, we'll be in the Philippines, and it's 8 o'clock on Thursday morning, September 21st. So, is the Lord going to come, if he's coming on September 21st, is he coming there first and then going to come here Four hours, five hours later, after it's September 21st. Uh, you know, it, when it's September 21st, one place, it's still September 20th somewhere else. So which day is he coming on, the 20th or the 21st? You see, you, you can't know. Man can't know the day or the hour. The Lord can come because he's not bound by days or hours. God doesn't live in time. You understand? He is, he, he's not bound by time like we are. So don't be deceived by false teachers, okay? Number three, don't be deceived. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Oh, fasten your seatbelts here, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Don't be deceived about who goes to heaven. Don't be deceived about who goes to heaven. Look at verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But such and such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, Ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The, the deception is to believe that I can, 
I can be a fornicator or an idolater or adulterer or effeminate or I can be abusers of self of mankind. That's, that, th- those words are referring to someone who wants to be a homosexual lifestyle or lesbian lifestyle or any other letters that they put with it now. I know it's L. I, I don't even know all the letters, but uh, there's a lot of them now. And uh, that would all be included there. Nor thieves or covetous or drunkards or revilers or extortioners. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You say, oh, you're, you're being judgmental. No, I'm just reading the Bible. Amen. That's what the book says. I, I'm not trying to be mean or unkind. I am trying to be truthful with you. You see, these are, these are, these are character traits and these are lifestyle choices. By the way, that that if this remains your lifestyle, in other words, then your life has not been changed by Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ comes in, a change takes place. Plain and simple. You say, well, I still do these things and I pray to prayer. Then all you did was pray a prayer. Okay? Salvation didn't happen. Okay? There's nowhere in the Bible that it says praying a prayer makes you a Christian. Okay? I know we say sinner's prayer. You know, there's no such thing in the Bible as a sinner's prayer. Okay? We, we package it all up and make it real tidy and nice, but you have to be careful about that. Nobody's saved when you just talk to them and say, okay, just repeat this prayer after me. Hmm? Be careful about that. You see, there's an impact, there's a change that takes place. What, what is happening here is not somebody, listen, it's not somebody who, who uh, uh, may... Uh, a thief. Well, I took a pencil at work the other day. I guess I'm not going to heaven. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about someone who, who uh, listen, all of these things are in all of our heart. Jesus made that clear earlier, didn't he? Okay? It's not that you might do that one time or slip one time. This is somebody who is constant and continuously living this way. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. They're constantly and continuously living that way. It's not somebody who in a moment of weakness or a moment of temptation commits a sin. Then you confess your sin. And God is faithful and just to forgive you your sin. Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You see, you, you know your nature by what you're content to stay in. I can, I can get the pig and I can clean him up and wash him up and get him looking good and perfume him up and he smells good and put a nice jewel in his snout. But as soon as I let the pig out, as soon as he can, he's going back to the mud hole. Why? That's his nature. He's a pig. Okay? But you take a lamb and you get the lamb out of the mud hole and clean that lamb up and wash her up and get it clean, the lamb will stay away from the mud hole. Why? It's not a lamb's nature to go fall in the mud. Okay? So you, you look and you say, well, I'm more comfortable around doing these things or hanging around these people or doing these things, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but you know, then, then you're revealing your nature. If you don't like being around church people, you don't like around Christians at church, that, uh, that says something about your nature. If you'd rather be in the mud hole than around God's people. Okay? So don't be deceived. All right? Number four. Let's not be deceived. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. You're in 1 Corinthians 6. Just turn over to your right a few pages. Are you okay? Everybody all right? 1 Corinthians 15. Verse. You say, Pastor, are you saying that someone who practices homosexuality can't be saved? That, no, I didn't say that. The Bible said that. Okay, just the way it is. Just same as uh, covetous or drunkard or whatever other other things are listed there. Same way. Okay, you all right? Okay, just what it says. Number four. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, please. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Wow. Evil communications corrupt good manners. The deceived here simply means it will lead you astray. The idea is you have to keep your thoughts 
aligned with the truth, with what's right, or you'll go away, you'll go astray into deceptive thinking. You always, a Christian always has to make conscious choices not to let his mind think into, or slip into deceptive thinking. Because the world will force you to think like they think. And if you're not careful, you get caught up in that. We, we talked about last night in our Bible class how sometimes in, our, in, in the preaching, you, you get, somebody says, listen, you just need to keep your focus. Don't lose your focus. Really? Is that what the Christian life's all about? No. The Christian life's all about looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Is there a difference when I say, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ? Don't go looking at other people. Keep your eyes on Jesus Man, turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Oh, you've got to keep focused on Jesus Christ. That's a big difference in just saying, don't lose your focus. You see, one is just psychology. I'm just telling you what anybody who doesn't even know Jesus would tell you. There's a difference. And we've got to make sure we're using Bible language. Okay? Don't be deceived into the world's thinking. And the biggest way, to, the quickest way to slip into the wrong thinking is by who you hang around. Who you choose to be around. And by the way, this can be, this can be real people as far as flesh and blood that you reach out and touch and you communicate and you talk to. Or it can be people that you invite into your home through a, it used to be a box, now it's just a screen. But you invite them into your home. Do you invite people in that are cursing and swearing and denying God and lying and cheating and stealing? And you invite them into your home to entertain you? You evil communications will corrupt good manners. You begin to think that bad companions are actually friends of value. When you begin to hang around people that have the wrong thinking, you'll begin to think wrong. You'll begin to do wrong things. The word evil here, evil communications or evil companions, if you will, has the idea that these people are bad at the core. Their hearts are not good towards God. Their, their thoughts and their patterns are not lined up with God or His Word. And we begin to get corrupted when, when we think that, well, they're not that bad. I know they're not like us. I know they're not really sold out. I know they're not really good Christians. But you know, we, we have a good time. And you're headed for trouble. People who live without convictions from God or any kind of restraint from God or His Word. No, no, no godly worth in their words or their actions or their lifestyles. God says that's evil. And even in the model prayer, He taught us to deliver us from evil. And that's hard sometimes when you have people that you formed a friendship with to say, I'm not going to be able to be friends with them anymore. Because of the effect they're having on me spiritually. And some of those people, listen, some of those folks are not just people found in the gutter of society. Some of those people you find at church. There's some people that even at church, you may not necessarily want to be friends. You have to be careful. We tell the people at RU that RU isn't a social network. is isn't where you hook up with other people. Be careful about that. Why? Because you hook up with someone who had the same addiction you had and boy, in a weak moment, you both start using. 
you can feed off each other, it can be dangerous. You have to be very, very careful. You know, you have to, it, it, doesn't take, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know what a person is like in their words, their actions, and their lifestyle. You just observe their words, their actions, their lifestyle, and, and that's going to display their heart, what kind of a heart they have. You ought, to, you ought to be able to, someone ought to be able to follow you around and watch you and, and observe how you live. If, if you didn't even know they're watching you, they just observe how you live. And if they observed you for a day or two, they should be able to say, that person loves Jesus Christ. That person is a Christian. They shouldn't, and, and by the way, they should be able to come to that conclusion if they followed you on a Thursday, or a Friday, and a Saturday. Not a Sunday or a Wednesday. Because you went to church. But they would still be able to know because of your words and your actions and your lifestyle that you are a believer. Don't, don't buy into the deception that I can hang around, I can be companions with people whose words and actions and lifestyles deny God and do not want to please God and it will not affect me. Because it certainly will. It absolutely will. You have been around somebody and something happens or they get hurt or, or something uh, shocking takes place and a word comes out of their mouth that is a curse word. And they go, oh, oh I don't know where that came from. Yeah, I do. You were hanging around somebody who talked that way. Or you let someone in through that screen talk that way in your house. And you heard it. And what goes in, at some point, comes out. See? Evil communications corrupt good manners. That's how evil works its way into our lives. See, the problem you, that, that you and I would just call bad friends, God calls evil. God calls evil. Now, who do you think sees it better? Us or God? Absolutely. God sees it right. Some wrong things a person does can be all those persons, can always be on that person. But the wrong kind of friends are those who entice you to do things that violate God's principles that you would never violate on your own. The wrong kind of friends are those who entice you to, to violate God's principles that you would never violate on your own. Everybody we're with, everybody who we're companions with, is an influence in our life. They either influence us for good, or they're influencing us for evil. Everybody who we're around either draws us closer to Christ, or pushes us further from Christ. And everybody has to look at the companions in their life on a regular basis and say, do I have the right people in my life? And do I need to get some people out of my life that are pushing me away from Christ? They're not helping me. Don't be deceived. You, you cannot have evil companions and have a close relationship with Jesus Christ. Won't happen. This, this may be one of the biggest reasons that people don't succeed in our U program. Is they never cut the ties with the old friends. That they still think are friends. That they still think it's okay to have them in my life. 
But more than likely, when you think about when they go backwards and they end up using drugs again or they end up smoking again, it's because they're hanging around people who use drugs and smoke. I guarantee you. I, you know what? I didn't, I didn't smoke this week. Aren't you glad? You know what? I didn't hang around people who did. I didn't curse this week. I don't hang around people who curse. See? I'm not going to do it. We've, we've for years, if we have a program on and somebody says a curse word, it, it goes off. We don't watch it. Nobody's going to come into my house and curse. I'm not going to allow it. So don't be deceived. Be careful. It's interesting, and the whole context of 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrection. And they were all messed up about the resurrection. One of the reasons they got messed up the resurrection is they were hanging around people who didn't believe in the resurrection. You see? And it affected them. So Paul had to address that. When it says you corrupt good manners, it, it has to do with your morals. Good manners mean, means right moral practices. In other words, God's saying don't be deceived. Having close friendships with the wrong kinds of people destroy a person's morality. Now do you think God knows what He's talking about? I, I'll guarantee you God knows what He's talking about and I've seen it happen over and over and over again in 35 years of being in the ministry. What every believer needs is friends that will provoke them and help them to live godly. To please Jesus Christ. To do God's will for their life. So, look for those kind of friends. Ask yourself this question. Do the friends I have chosen help me to walk more closely with Jesus? Or do they hinder a closer walk with Jesus Christ? You can make your choices. You have, the, you, you have the freedom to choose. But you don't have the freedom to control the consequences of your choice. That will happen just exactly as God says it will. If I have friends that are influencing my life in unhealthy ways? Do I have friends that I do things with that I know that I would not do by myself? Then they are not my friends. They're evil. And I've got to see them the way God sees them. Or I'll never be what God wants me to be. Be not deceived. And I know, uh, when you tell somebody this, or the preacher preaches like this, there's people who sit out there and say, man, I'm not, you don't know what he's talking about. Who's he to tell me who I can be friends with, who I can't be with? I'm not trying to tell you. I am trying to tell you God's Word. And you ought to listen to what God says. Listen to what God says. Number five, and we'll be done. Got to hustle up here. Be not deceived about sowing and reaping. You're familiar with Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Galatians 6 and verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. I read this story several years ago. A woman was attempting to save her husband. She was trying to get him released. She was trying to have her husband released from the psychiatric ward where he'd been committed because she testified that he had tried to kill her and their two sons. She told the judge she thought her husband was mentally ill, so the court ordered him to be sent to the psychiatric ward. But suddenly, she had a change of heart and decided she wanted him back again. She went and announced that she had lied to the court. She staged a four-day sit-down Hunger strike at the hospital. Demanding they let her husband out. She even signed a waiver 
where she made the statement, I want him out even if he kills me. Well, they let him out. And three months later, her husband beat her and her two children to death with a two-foot length of pipe. You know what you call that? Sowing and reaping. She got exactly what she wanted. She paid the price for what she wanted to get. You know, a lot of people are that way with sin. They want their sin no matter what the price is. No matter what they have to pay. They seem to forget there's an undeniable principle. We reap what we sow. You see, there's, there's an indisputable law that God has sowing and reaping. You won't get around it. Sometimes we look at something and say, man, I don't know why that happened. Why don't you think about it a little bit? Sometimes things happen and we're trying to figure it out and if we just thought a little bit, we'd say, well, I know why that happened. I'm just reaping something I sowed back here. Well, everything happens for a purpose. Yeah, sometimes the purpose is you sowed some bad seed back here and now you're reaping it. We don't like to admit that sometimes. But that's the truth. You're gonna, you reap what you sow. You're going to reap exactly what you sow. The, you know, it goes on to say in, in, in the verse after, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. You sow to the flesh, what's that? Things that appeal to the fleshly nature. What's corruption? Hmm? Something is corrupt. It's rotten. Spoiled. It, and, and by the way, you go and sow to the flesh, it'll make you rotten. It'll, it'll, it'll make you spoiled. You know what? You know what rotten and spoiled things smell like? <laughs> they stink. And your testimony will stink. But if you sow to the Spirit, you sow to things that build you up spiritually, and you sow to things of God that the Spirit wants you to sow, it says... You'll reap life everlasting. Sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. You heard him say it the other night. Sin will take you further than you wanted to go and keep you longer than you wanted to stay and cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. You can't ignore the law of sowing and reaping. Job 4 verse 8. They that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. You'll reap what you sow. You can go ahead and sow the seeds of sin in your life. Go ahead. God lets you do it. But be prepared when you reap the harvest. Because you will reap. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. People are always trying to repeal that law, but you can't repeal it. It's absolute. But there's something else about sowing and reaping is you always reap more than what you sow. If a farmer plants 15 to 20 bushels of the seed, seed corn, is he going to harvest 15 to 20 bushels of corn? No. He's going to harvest a whole lot more than that. He's planning on that. We don't only reap, we don't only reap what we sow, we reap much more than we sow. No matter what we're sowing. You can sow sin, but you'll reap much more than just that sin. There's so much more heartache and so much more pain than just the sin. You can sow the sin of unbelief and not trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. You say, what's the big deal? What do you reap if that's the sin you sow? Yeah, death and hell for ever, for eternity. It's a huge price to pay, isn't it? You think, sometimes people think they get away with it because you don't always have the harvest right after you sow the seed. There's a time period. And sometimes when there's a time period, we think, well, that must be okay. I guess I'm not going to pay for this. <laughs> oh, just wait. Sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. 
It's a law of God. You will not get away from it. A little girl had a piggy bank and her father wanted to teach her about saving so he talked to her about taking the money out of her piggy bank and putting it into a savings account at the bank. This must have been back when savings account got you some interest. She said, the bank's gonna, he said, the bank will pay you interest on your money. And her money would grow that way. So the big day came and he took his daughter down to the bank and she gave her piggy bank to the woman at the, the window opening her account. And then they said, okay, thank you. And she gave her a slip saying her deposit. And the little girl just stood there looking at her. She said, is there something else I can do for you? And the little girl looked at him and said, no, I'm just waiting on my interest. And she had to understand, it doesn't happen that fast. Got to wait a while. You see, there's a delay between sowing that money in the account and reaping some interest on the account. So, there are a couple things and we'll be done. There's things happening in your life today that are, that are a result of what you have sown in the past. Some of you, some of you know you're having health difficulties now because of choices you made in the past. And you know that. That's sowing and reaping. You're reaping the harvest of what you sowed maybe a week ago, maybe a month ago, maybe a year ago, maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago. But number two is this. What will happen in the future will be determined on what you're sowing in your life today. You can't go back and undo that, that sowing you did back then, but you sure can start sowing differently now so you can reap differently in the future. If you want to change your future, change what you're sowing today. You know, the definition of insanity is you keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. You've got to change what you're sowing. If you're sowing sin, though, there will surely be no harvest failure. When you sow with God, there will be a wonderful harvest in heaven. What will happen to your future depends on what you're sowing right now. What are you sowing right now? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You're not going to mock God on this. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You won't get around it. Be not deceived. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for everyone's attention tonight and thank you for this important subject. So many, many warnings in the Bible about us not being deceived and not being led astray. Not being uh, uh, altered in our mind to believe something that isn't true. Or to disbelieve things that are true. It's a constant battle. I pray, Lord, that each of us would yield ourselves to Thy Holy Spirit and to Your Word. For Your Word is truth. Trustworthy dependable, faithful. Your, your, your word is right in every area of life. And I pray your word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path to guide our steps aright. Lord, help us to sow the good seed and sow to the Spirit that we may reap the life everlasting. Thank you for everyone's attention tonight. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. And help us to live the Bible we've been taught this evening. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, 128. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. Let's sing that together, shall we? Here we go. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart Since Jesus made everything right I gave him my old tattered garment He gave me a robe of pure white I'm feasting on manna from heaven And that's why I'm happy That's why you're happy That's why we're happy